Ready? Okay, Dan and, and I would like to uh, present to you some information that, uh, about how the Salvation Army utilises uh, and has been for quite some time. The free tools, uh, the, free, the free versions of the hypervisor that you can get from VMware. So we're just going to go through with that agenda that you can read. Okay, I guess it's over to me. Um, I started working for the Salvation Army in 1994. Um, my first position with the Salvation Army was actually in Moscow, Russia, where I started in finance. Uh, and then I took on the role of IT manager while I was there at the same time. Uh, I did six years in Russia before moving to the international office in London. And I didn't do any finance work in, Russia, uh, in, in London, which was great, but started with a sole focus on Lotus Notes. Now, as my role increased over the time I was there. I tended to do a lot more international support. The Salvation Army is, of course, an international organisation. And we used to have to go out to various locations around the world, and I could be required to do anything from pulling cables through a wall to going into doing negotiations on various contracts, etc. So since 94, I've had the uh, privilege of visiting over 54 countries, <coughs> the majority of the time with the work that I do. And I've looked at an enormous amount of different technologies. Uh, my current role, I've been in since 2008, and I've been based in Melbourne. My title is the Spear Zone Consultant. So in my remit now, I only have to worry about 22 countries, which is better than what I used to have to worry about. Um, and I've been to, in recent times, 17 of them. So why haven't you visited the other ones? The other part? Time and money. <laughs> So I was a bit ahead of Dan. I started in 1985 uh, as a programmer, uh, working on a, the, uh, a VAC 750. Uh, and I was trying to remember the name of the application development software that we used, and I couldn't find it. And fortunately, we didn't have any old manuals or anything lying around the office, so that's a good thing. I'm currently the IT technical manager, and I have several streams of uh, technologies that I look after, but one of them is VMware our virtualization, and also our Citrix stack of um, application virtualization, I guess. Uh, and the other area is uh, Nodes and Domino. I started working with VMware in version 2, and I was trying to work out how long ago that was too, and it was a fair while. And in the the version upgrade from 2 to 2.5 and from 2.5 to 3, I did manually without any um, but, uh, vMotion or any shared storage. So I learned a lot about SCP, what was it? The, the, I can't remember what it was, the, the SCP. copy of SCP, yeah. that's right, the copy of files around. And that's when I found out about the, the VMware forums and, and those sort of things, and that's where I got most of my knowledge about how to do it. Uh, the Salvation Army in, is, divides Australia into two territories, and I work for the Southern Territory, represented by AWS, and we have an eight host uh, ESXi file <coughs> cluster, so a small thing with who knows what it is, 60 terabytes of shared storage. and. 150 production VMs and 100 odd test and dev things. Uh, almost everything's virtualized except for a couple of outliers that we've really run out of space and a few other reasons why we haven't done it. And that will happen very soon. We've got an upgrade to 5.5 happening in the next few weeks, I think. Uh, and so that would be, that, that will coincide with a few other things and that should let me get, get everything virtualized. Okay, brief history of the Salvation Army. I'm sure many people will probably know some of this, but it was started by William Booth back in 1865 in, uh, I was going to say Melbourne, that's not right, in, in London. Um, William Booth was a Methodist minister and he had a passion for helping the poor and the homeless, the destitute, that type of person, and he'd spent a lot of time working with them. Uh, he found that his original process was to try and go through and convert these people, bring them back into the Christian church, and then get them back into the churches of the uh, Victorian England time frame. But he found in doing that, these people were not always welcomed in the church environment. So he started his own church. It was originally called the East London Christian Mission. 
It went on to become called the Christian Mission, and then in 1878, it was renamed the Salvation Army, which is what we know it as today. Okay, so since that time, um, the Salvation Army has expanded to 126 countries worldwide. Um, although it's still focused as a Christian church, and that's its main function, it's more known globally in just about every country for the social work that it does. So, we still work with the poor and the homeless, the hungry, etc. Uh, we are also heavily involved in running schools, children's homes, hospitals, shelters. We do feeding programs, we do homework clubs for kids, all that sort of thing. That all comes under the remit of the Salvation Army. So I explained before that I look after the South Pacific and East Asia zone. It's not the best picture, but it's a fairly close one of what I do. Um, all those countries fall under my remit, um, including Australia. You can see how it's divided in two colours. Tony's area is the, uh, the biggest of the two colours. So he's part of the Southern Territory, which includes Darwin and the Northern Territory. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave Tony to work that one out with you. Um, but that's what we call the South Pacific and East Asia Zone, and we, its acronym is SPEAR. So one of our problems that we originally had... Um, we're, okay, we operate in 126 countries, we operate across multiple languages, we operate with people with various skills, and we have to have one corporate system. In the early days, we had a huge problem with getting hardware in most places. You can see those two different boxes. Um, they were actually bought in the UK, and then we had to physically carry them out to the different locations. One of them's in Tanzania, one of them's in uh, Zimbabwe. But those sort of boxes appeared everywhere we went. So every place the Salvation Army was working was relying on those particular servers. And they were real powerful beasts. I think at one stage we had a they had about 512 meg of RAM in there. Yeah? So real powerful beast, and that was running our office. Getting parts for these machines was near I impossible. I can remember being on the ground in Zambia and going out to fix one of these machines. I couldn't get any hard drives for it. I couldn't get any RAM for it. I couldn't get anything for it locally. We could only get it by shipping it back out from the UK, which is a very expensive thing to do. So we had to try and find a better solution. Now these boxes were running uh, Windows NT and a Domino server and that was about it. They couldn't really run much more than that. So what we did is we came up with this solution which was called a suitcase server. Now a suitcase server, the whole concept was we would build it on two laptops. The laptops would run Ubuntu and VMware server. Now those boxes would then have Windows 2003 on it. We could load a Domino server on it, we could run an Asterix phone system on it, and we could run terminal services. So this became our solution for all these offices around the world. Instead of trying to find these big, horrendous boxes that were very heavy, we could actually build these laptops in our office in the UK, and when we flew out to a place, we could stick them in our hand luggage and take them with us. Uh, there were lots of other little things that we could have with them. We took out backup drives, we took out firewalls. Because the kit was so small, it fitted nicely into a suitcase. Now, some of the advantages. These devices were very small, so easy to transport. And the picture here is the two laptops that looked after our Taiwan office. Okay? So these are actual machines that were in operation. As I said, we could configure it in our office. If one of these units actually failed, they could FedEx it back to the UK, we could restore it from the image, the original image, put the backup back on, FedEx it back out to them, and that was done very quickly. So we had an occasion when hard drives failed, um, and within the space of a week, the machine was in London, back out to its location, and up and running again. It also allowed us to have an option of being able to deploy an office very quickly. So you remember the tsunami that happened a few years ago? The Salvation Army was heavily involved in a place called Medan, which is in Indonesia, and we had to set up a, a project office out there. So again, we set up two laptops, connected to wireless terminals, sent out all running on Ubuntu and VMware server. Proved to be something, an office that we could set up in next to no time. Uh, one of the problems that we had 
is um, they weren't very expandable. So we were, we were stuck with the size of a hard disk and a laptop. And when that became full, it became a problem. One of the problems that I tended to find was when I took the laptops into one particular place in Tanzania, the head of the army in Tanzania looked at it and said, ooh, new laptop, I will have that. Couldn't explain to him though that that was going to be his server, and he had seen previously the server being a huge box. So he took a little bit of convincing to get him to understand that no, this new laptop's not for him, not going on his desk, it's actually going to act as a server. The WISE terminals could be a pain to set up. Not if you're using in English, but as I said, we operate in numerous languages and setting up WISE terminals in traditional Chinese is a real pain. Especially when you have to speak Chinese. Um, I did have the luxury of an interpreter when I was doing it, and every time a big red box came up with a cross on it, they said, <coughs> error. So I'd say, give me some more information. <laughs> big error. <laughs> Not a great deal of help, but um, it can be done. But our biggest problem was laptops are small, they're light, and they're very easy to pinch. So we did bolt these things down to iron bars and desks and all sorts of things, but we did lose them. People would come in, cut through the iron bar, and take the laptop. Okay. Transporting them, um, initially we were putting them in our hand luggage, and then the problems of 9-11 and a few other things, airlines became very pedantic about what we could carry onto a plane and forced us to put them into suitcases. I arrived in Tanzania with my suitcases, minus the laptops. So when you go out to do a job in very restricted time, um, that's a real problem. But having the whole thing built on images, we were able to quickly build new laptops, FedEx them out to Tanzania and got up and running in next to no time at all. So because of the problems with the laptops, we went for a second solution. And we built, some, uh, built a server on a media center. Now, my able assistant is pulling out a media center for us. Basically, it looks like a DVD player. Now, again, it was built running on Linux with VMware server on it. And it's a real beast of a box. It works really well and it works really fast. And um, one of the nice things about it is when you go through customs, the customs officers look at it and think it's a DVD player and wipe you through. So, slight benefit there. It does play DVDs. It does play DVDs as well. <laughs> So if we were ever asked to prove that, it would do it. Um, but we use it as a server. Again, doing the same things. Had Windows 2003 on it, Domino server on it, running terminal services, running file shares, and mirrored drives. So if you want to have a look at it, you can. We don't use them anymore, and I'll explain why. Although it was easy to carry, it was very fast and very powerful, for no apparent reason, the RAID controller would simply die on us. And that meant a real problem, because when you try to get the RAID controller up and running again, it would format the hard drives. And that tended to be a huge problem. <laughs> um, in a lot of these places that we put them, like through Africa and through some of our places in Asia, uh, it's quite warm. And so, people would tend to put things on top of them. Now, if you have come up and have a look at the box later, you'll notice that the top of it is full of air vents. That helps keep it cool. But when they were put out into different locations, people tended to stack lots of things on top of those air vents. So the things used to get very hot and then die on us. So that wasn't very good. And the last problem that we had is that the VMware server was being phased out at this particular time and going with ESXi. Um, now, I, don't, I guess you guys all remember when that was happening that you used to have to look up on the, the website for approved hardware listings to make it work. Our media centre was never on the approved hardware <laughs> listing. <laughs> and that was a real problem. Now, we spoke to a couple of VMware guys and they said, oh, it will probably work, but what we tended to find is that when it would go through, it would go through so far of the installation and then it would say, don't recognise the RAID controller, and just stop. 
So sometimes we could get a patch that would help us with that. It would go so far through the, the installation again and then it would say, don't recognize the video driver and just stop. So it meant we ended up with a, a huge problem because we weren't able to get VMware server anymore and ESXi didn't work on our little box. So we had to look for another, another solution. And another solution was to go back to actual hardware, server hardware. Now, as I said to you before, our initial problem was we used to have to buy all this server hardware and ship it out from London. And we couldn't get anything locally. Enough years have now passed that that is no longer the case. In most of the countries that we are working, there are local suppliers, local support people, and we can get parts. So we actually don't need to buy anything out of London anymore. We can actually buy it all locally. So this is a HP ProLiant server. It was bought in Taiwan. It replaced those two laptops that we saw earlier on. And we moved off the process of using Ubuntu and VMware server, and we installed ESXi. Now, why do we do it on the budget? Um, the Salvation Army, in most places, the exception is where Tony is, but in most of the places that we deal with through Africa, through a lot of the South Asia countries, South Pacific countries, our budget for IT starts at zero. Right? It goes down. And goes down. <laughs> so, you know, you might think that that can't really happen, but it does. A lot of our locations, if you talk about the Philippines, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, they actually, the Salvation Army doesn't run at a break-even point, we run at a loss. The programs and all the work that we do requires additional support funding from other countries. So therefore, we can't get a budget in IT, we don't have the money. Um, you know, I have a, an IT director in Indonesia and I pay him $230 a month. I can't afford to pay any more, okay? Now, Indonesia is not the cheapest place to live. So that's one of the problems we have. So we have no budget for any of this. So working to get hardware, we have to look for stuff that's going to be reliable. We have to look for stuff that's going to last a long time. Because when we do raise the funds for it, it goes in, we need to make sure that that stuff's going to last at least five years because it's not likely we're going to get any more funding to replace it in that time. So this is the server that we put into um, Taiwan. It was running um, ESXi 4. Point something, 4.5? 4. 4. Something like that. Zero one. Zero one. Well, there you go. Um, and it ran very well. We have changed the model in most of our locations now so that we, if you think back, we were using a laptop with terminal services and wise boxes. We've managed to get rid of all of that now. And we use two servers in each of our server rooms in a lot of these locations, except for places like Australia, who have huge server rooms with lots of equipment, or New Zealand. Um, so we have two physical boxes. Generally, one is a ProLiant, HP ProLiant, one is a Dell. So we're covering our, way, our, our options both ways based on what we can buy with support in those countries. Those servers have a number of virtual machines on them. So generally, uh, we do a build that's got two Active Directory servers, one on each physical box, but as a virtual machine. We have two Domino servers. Again, virtual machines, but one on each physical box. So that we're now building redundancy into these places that we're going to. Some of these offices, when we started out with the original solution of two laptops, only had five or six people in them. So it was easy to run it over a small environment. But in many of these locations, the army has grown significantly. So we might have an office from anywhere from 20 to 70 people in it. And you can't run that off a laptop unless you, know, you expect it to be slow. So we have now two physical boxes. We run finance servers. We run AV servers. But we don't have any shared storage because that's an expense that we can't afford at this point in time. Um, so that's how we use VMware. Um, it's proven to be very good for us uh, because it allows us now to fill the business need that we have in all of these locations 
we do it at a very low price. Um, you might say, okay, well, how do you afford things like Windows, etc.? We use companies like TechSoup that allow us to buy Windows at a very discounted rate. So what you pay for it, about 95% less than that, is what we can get it for because we are a non-profit charity. So we are able now to set up our office environment in a fairly uh, robust type of way to allow our people to work permanently. If we went back to the original machines that were installed, when they went down, everything was down for weeks. Finding parts from them was a problem. We had to send a technician, usually from the UK, out to repair them and get things up and running again. And it was only one server that was doing everything. Now, uh, it's quite robust. A lot of these servers I have access to remotely, so I can manage them from here, although I do go on site and still visit. Is there another slide? I think it shows, to me it shows that how even, even in this sort of tight time and budget frame, that the value of VMware and the, once you virtualize it and the server becomes a file and you can move it around and you can swap it out, and you know, the, the, the hate, the, the um, high availability of having two servers <coughs> now where you wouldn't have been able to afford that in the past. And the fact that if something does really drastically go wrong, they can send out another image from London and you can get it up and running again quite quickly. And none of those things would have been possible without some level of virtualization. So even though you don't have all the, the gizmos and the, and the magic, just the bare bones of it still shows the, the true value of, of, of what virtualization can give to people. Here's our marketing slide. We're just about to start the Red Shield um, campaign uh, in Victoria, so... Well, it's across Australia, actually. It is across Australia. So Sunday week, um, the Salvation Army will be knocking on everyone's door uh, around the country, raising their fund, uh, raising funds. Um, those funds go to help the Salvation Army in Australia, so they don't necessarily help the work that I do, which is generally more outside of Australia. But um, that just makes you aware that it's, it's coming. So we had to put a marketing slide up, I think. And it doesn't go towards buying me any more new hardware, either. No. <laughs> More, yeah. more There's a website there somewhere. <laughs> but it's pretty small. Um, so, salvos.com, I think, as well. Salvos.com, I think, as well. Salvos, And they've got a great uh, online donation portal there that you can try out. So, questions? <coughs> How, uh, how much of a, of a limited budget have you had throughout that? I mean, you, you especially talk when you were uh, here in Australia, you've got a, got a fair bit of stuff. Is that the case in most of the developed Western countries, or is Australia a bit of an odd case? Australia's not an odd case. <laughs> it's it's but, something like 14 <coughs> territories, so the US is divided into four territories. Mm -hmm. I think there's about 14 or 16 territories around the world who fund basically the rest of the, of the 128 countries is about 10 countries so funded all. So a territory is not it doesn't necessarily relate to a country. Yeah. Um, so if you think of Australia, that's two territories. But out of all of those 126 countries worldwide, I think there's only probably seven or eight that fund have have sufficient funds that allows it to generate enough funding to fund the rest of the world. Okay. Now that model is slowly starting to change, um, which is great. And some of our more developed places, uh, more of our underdeveloped places have got to put more pressure on raising funds themselves. Um, but from an IT perspective, our budget is nearly always zero. Yeah. And, and the reason for that, if you, know, if you talk about the Philippines, you know, they run children's homes, they run hospitals. And if I go to them and say, you know, I, I need $5,000 for an IT project, they're going to turn around and say, well, we're going to buy something for the maternity ward, so which now is more of a priority? Do we fund something in the maternity ward or do we give you $5,000? And I can tell you, 100 times out of 100, it doesn't come to me. <laughs> All right? So everything that we do, um, the Salvation Army International has a standard uh, as far as IT infrastructure is concerned. So we all have to do the same in every country because the Salvation Army officers from any country can be moved to any other country. And the last thing we want them to do is be sitting in the Philippines, get moved to Australia, 
get sat in front of a PC and think, I don't know how to use this. Yeah. Okay, we actually have had that problem in the past where we, we brought one person, a lovely lady out of Central Africa, brought her, to U, brought her to the UK, sat her in front of a PC and said, right, you're now responsible for our electronic filing system. And she said, thank you, that's a great job. I'm very happy with it. I've never seen a PC before in my life. Okay, so that was one of the problems we had initially. So it is very important that the infrastructure that we put in place is the same in every single country. But when you operate a number of countries on a zero budget, that's a very hard thing to do. So, so how many in IT have you got globally? Globally? Yeah. Are we talking hundreds or handful? Or? Uh, globally, probably hundreds. Now, if you, if you think of a, a small area in the United States, like we would call it a division, so it might, it might be half a state in the United States, they could have 15 members of staff, okay? That's great for them, but you know, I have two members of staff in Indonesia, and they have to look after about 700 users across the numerous islands in Indonesia, okay? I've got two staff in Papua New Guinea, and when I have to send someone in Papua New Guinea to an outlying place, like I've got a guy coming up to Leh and then Garoko, you know, there's no roads in New Guinea, so I've got to fly them everywhere. That's a cost that I have to pick up, or that we have to pick up. Um, I've got one person in the Philippines, and he covers every island in the Philippines, because I can't afford to employ anyone else. Right. Um, I've got no one in Taiwan, because I can't afford anyone there. I've got one person for all of Japan. So, in some of my places, because the army doesn't generate a lot of funding, but they have hundreds of programs they have to support, IT becomes a second step. But at the same time, you know, every location has to have the same infrastructure as everywhere else, because there is the potential. And you know, I've got a person from Japan who's now working in London. You know, I've got a person from Korea who's working in London. So the systems have to be the same, because the, the people have to be able to be moving around. Okay. But out of 126 countries, mm -hmm. you keep moving people toward the same infrastructure. How do you tackle uh, language barriers, different skill levels? Uh, That's a huge problem for us. Not well. Not well. <laughs> so, and it's, it's, it's still one of your major core problems. Um, yeah, we operate, I don't know how many languages. Um, the languages that I've worked and installed, I've done English, that was the easiest. Um, I've installed in Russian, I've installed in Chinese, Spanish, French, German, Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese, and apparently that's very different. So if you go to Brazil and you get it wrong, they'll tell you about it. Um, Korean, Japanese, did I say Japanese? I've done Japanese. Um, so yeah, these are all the languages that we have to make work. And for people who get transferred around, they, there is the core language, which is English, okay? So, we've had people who have been transferred from Korea to Russia and Vladivostok, but they've been transferred there because there's a need amongst the Korean community in Vladivostok for a Korean speaking officer. But, and I know this from experience, when you go there, you've still got to learn the local language. You know, I lived in Moscow for six years, you can't survive in Moscow just speaking English. Well, you certainly couldn't back in 1994. It's a lot better now. But, you know, my second day in the office, I was really confident I got on the train to go home. I got out at the station, which looked like my station. I got up onto the, onto the road and realised I hadn't a clue where I was. Because what I didn't realise is that once you get to a certain point out of the, the central area, all the stations look the same. Literally, all look the same. And I couldn't read a word of Russian. So, you know, language is, is an issue, but it's one we have to deal with. So, you know, our core system being Lotus Notes, um, we operate that in multiple languages. It's, uh, you've moved away from San Martin altogether like, across the board? Uh, yeah, we have. Yeah. Uh, we've still got some, and we use Citrix in some places as well. Um, for my supported areas, we've moved away from Tim Clients, yeah. So Dan's mostly focused around the supported areas, all that. We have a lot of trouble 
with the definition of it used to be funded and grant aided, but they didn't like that. So all the all the countries that are like Australia, where we can afford all the proper technology and fund it ourselves, we have proper IT infrastructure and, and IT people. Uh, but by using the same technologies, it means that we can help Dion and his lot out. You know, if they have a technical question, we, because they're using something that we know about, then we can help them. If they were using something else, then we wouldn't be able to. See, one of the ideas with Thin Clients was we would go onto the server, we would create the account, do everything for them. All they'd have to do is turn on the wise box, put their username and password in, most of the time they got it right, and they're away. Um, but that caught. We had issues, especially you know, if you were working in something like Chinese, it was often more of a problem than it was worth. And the other issues that we had was we weren't able to afford things like Windows licenses or hardware. But when we um, when we work with TechSoup, you know, we can buy a Windows license for about four dollars, genuine Windows license. Now that's only available to charities, non profits. Okay, and that we're limited on how many we can buy in each country in any given period, but we're able to set up that way so we can get proper licensed software on a proper desktop machine and you know there, there is enough screen sharing software, we use Bongar, um, some places use TeamViewer, so it's easy enough now to log on to a machine and fix a problem for a user. Yeah. How do you deal with the, the overheads with things like double byte character sets because you need a special keyboard and does it affect your SOE image for your systems? I've worked um, with printing in Katakana and Kenji and things like that and that was always a curse because they needed special, say, Thai keyboards or um, yeah. Things like that, you had to load extra drivers into the systems. We had a lot of problems with that in um, or with Windows XP. Since we've been sta standardised on Windows 7, um, each local environment, the Windows is in the local language. Okay, um, we can do that with Lotus Notes to a lot of effect. So you know, Notes version 4.5. You know, when I rolled that out in Russia, getting Cyrillic to work, you know, bang your head against the wall all day, and it's still not going to work. But Lotus will tell you it does. But once we've moved on to more modern platforms, so Windows 7, um, you know, running it in its native language, we find that those problems are resolved. Yeah? At some point, you said that you were having a lot of obstacles using shared files, shared storage. Is that still the case? Uh, we don't really have shared storage for um, our VMware servers, okay? Because while we would like to do that, the cost of putting something like that in place um, is a problem. We're in, well, Tony's environment is slightly different, but in my one environment where I have that, which is in the Philippines, um, it, it works really well. And you know, the problems that we have is sometimes people don't always know what the Salvation Army is and we'll try and take you for a ride. And unfortunately, we had that happen to us in the Philippines and we ended up with a system which was massively overkill, but the contract was already signed, so there's nothing we could do about it. Um, so we have a, a blade system that runs in the Philippines and that has shared storage. And it was originally spec'd for, you know, it could run probably 10,000 users on it. No? Oh, it's 70. <laughs> All right. So we went into quite a negotiated contract with the, the people who forced us, uh, who signed it, because the person there thought he knew what he was doing, signed a contract without reference. Okay. He doesn't work for us anymore. But we have to pick up the mess. Um, but the shared storage worked really well because we did actually have one of those blades fail. So we were able to move it onto another blade. Last question? Mm -hmm. How you guys deal with the backup? Like, it's a central or country basis or local? No, it's on a per country basis. Um, that's a good question. 
we back up in a couple of different ways. So um, our file system is, um, so we do take snapshots, not regularly, because the size of the servers means that we can't store them anywhere. Um, so individual servers like our file servers, we run things like um, uh, the semantic backup software and we'll back it up to an external hard drive. In addition to that, we have in a number of our locations, and specifically with our finance servers, we use the, um, I don't remember the name of it, but it, it runs with the Amazon online service, so actually back up to the cloud. Uh, it works really well, we test it regularly, um, we're very happy with it, but it doesn't work in all of our locations. So, for instance, in New Guinea we don't back up to the cloud, because we pay for a one meg circuit on a good day, because it's a satellite, you know, we might get 256k. So trying to run any backups over that to the cloud is impossible. So what happened on one day like that site called down? Like We're backing up to external hard drives. It is a fake based organization. <laughs> 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 so that's, that's, a it is. That's, that's a critical part of our business continuity plan. So yeah, and, and you get site, the headquarters is on a very large compound. So at one end is where the headquarters is. In the middle of the compound is a um, secondary college um, where kids come to school. Um, right next door to the secondary college is a driving school that the Salvation Army run and it has the best reputation through all of Papua New Guinea because we teach people how to drive properly. And apparently the waiting list is something like <coughs> two years to get into the Army's driving school. And that's a program we do which actually generates income for the Salvation Army. And then at the far end of the compound is an administration block and then houses. So we back up to a NAS and then across a fibre link to the other end of the compound we also run back up to there. So we have two different locations. So oh, last nice. question, yeah. Thanks, yeah. What software are you using for backup? Um, Semantic. Um, I personally don't like it, but that's what they use because they can get support for it. And then it's the cloud version is um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it links to um, Amazon Web Services. I think it's called Miranda or something like that. It comes out. It was created in um, the west coast of the US and it's common throughout the US. But it works very well, because it just puts a, a small applet onto the server, then you select your files, and it just runs and sends you a report. Okay, cool, all right. Uh, just thanks to Dion and the uh,